Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Hero. Hi there, friends. This is Brian Sanders, whose name and photo is now featured on the cover of this podcast. I'm the guy who's making the Food Lies film, which has taken up much of the last two years of my life. I've interviewed about 150 people now, both formally and casually, on topics of nutrition, health, exercise, and the environment. I'm also the guy that posts something every day on social media that interests me or conveys a point that currently has my attention. Search for Food Lies on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, and you'll find some great content. Start back at episode one to get the full health info download. Share with friends and family and give it a review on iTunes or the Apple podcast app. Please know that I really appreciate all of you for doing this. I love interacting with people daily on these social platforms. It helps continue my quest for simple truths about health and nutrition and hopefully not get caught up in one way of thinking. Let's get straight to today's guest, Mark Schatzker, who is the author of The Dorito Effect and another book called Steak. I really enjoyed The Dorito Effect and have brought it up multiple times on this podcast. His award-winning journalism has appeared in The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Condé Nast Traveler, and Best American Travel Writing. He is a field reporter for The Dr. Oz Show, as well as a radio columnist for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I really connected with Mark in this episode on so many things. I'm really excited about this one and think it might help people to look at nutrition in a different light. Apparently, we've both been thinking about some of these nuances in the same way for years. We talked for a while after we stopped recording and followed up on email as well. Some of it may be controversial, so I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts. There's so much going on when we talk about the concept of processed foods. Even when I make a post about it, there's lots of confusion and pushback about what a processed food actually is. When I posted that the excess fat people carry is just a processed food they have eaten, there was an uproar. I still stand by this statement. There's three main components to what makes a processed food bad. The first is the diluting of good things like protein, vitamins, and minerals with empty calories like refined sugar, grains, and oils. The second is how those foods interact with your body. They can spike your blood sugar far more than whole foods, interact with your digestive system in different ways, and therefore affect hormones and satiety signals in different ways, as well as other inflammatory effects. The third is the hyperpalability factor, which leads to overconsumption. Throughout history, food processing increased nutrient density. Modern food processing pretty much across the board decreases nutrient density. Therein lies some of the confusion. Sauerkraut is a processed food by most definitions. But for me, it doesn't fit the classical definition because it makes a pretty empty food like cabbage that has anti-nutrients, therefore potentially detrimental, into something nutritious with vitamin C, probiotics, and very little anti-nutrients through the act of processing, in this case fermenting. Other people didn't understand how King Henry VIII, who was famously obese, could get that way without processed foods. Processed food doesn't just mean McDonald's and Oreos. <laughs> he had access to unlimited quantities of refined flour, baked goods, sugar, and alcohol. These are the worst of the processed foods. Just because you made a cake at home with organic flour and organic agave doesn't mean it's healthy for you. This also goes for a snack bar that is, quote, keto approved with all natural ingredients. Okay, enough out of me. We can get to the episode. I'll just make a YouTube video about it with all my thoughts in order and some graphics. Check the Food Lies YouTube for new videos each week. Also, please check out nosetotail.org, which we mentioned in this episode. This is my grass-fed meat company, which we both really believe in. And support this show on Patreon at patreon.com slash peakhuman so I can fend off the advertisers that keep contacting me. Now, please enjoy this compelling interview with my new pal and accomplished author and food investigator, Mark Schatzker. All right, Mark, how's it going over there in Toronto? It's going great. A little snowy, but uh, other than that, lovely day. How are you doing? I'm awesome. I'm here in LA. I just got some sun before we got on the call, and I actually brushed up on your first book, Dorito Effect. And actually, I might come to Toronto. I I came last year for a a master's track meet, and I'll probably do that again. There's a world championships of old people track and field in Toronto in the summer. Well, I will happily cheer you on from the sidelines, but I'm not sure I'll compete. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah, let's jump into your book, Dorito Effects. People have heard of it before. I've mentioned it. I've read it over a year ago. So I've kind of brought it up on the podcast a couple of times. 
So we can go into that. And then you wrote another book called Steak, which is really cool. It's about your mission to find the perfect steak and travel around the world. So we'll touch that later. But how'd you even get into all this? Why'd you write the Dorito Effect? Well, you know, it's funny you say that. Why'd I write the Dorito Effect? I wrote the Dorito Effect because I wrote Steak. And I wrote Steak for a very simple reason was that I really like steak, but I got very frustrated that most steak is really mediocre. And then every now and again, you'd have this kind of mind blowing, where did this steak come from steak? And that led to questions like, why do we like what we like? What is flavor? What were we designed to eat? Are humans supposed to eat meat? How has flavor changed? So steak was really a journey about finding out what we did to this, what I consider sacred food. But a light bulb went off while I was writing it and researching it, which is that steak isn't the only food. We've been manipulating the food that we eat for decades now. And the way we manipulate it is the flavor. The flavor of what we eat has been changing. That light bulb went off during the research for steak. And I realized this is something no one's talking about. It's massive. It's happening to basically all processed food and a lot of food that we wouldn't quote processed It's a very important subject. I mean, food is hugely important. We eat it three times a day at least. And obesity is our biggest health problem. And yet we never talk about flavor. And The Dorito Effect is really a book that looks at the food problem through the lens of flavor. Seems weird, right? We always talk about carbs and fat, you know, macronutrients. Mm -hmm. But we all eat for the pleasure of eating. And yet we never talk about that. So that's why I wrote The Dorito Effect was really to say, hey, folks, What have we done to the experience of eating? How has that changed? And what's that doing to us? And the answer is, it's doing a lot of really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so interested in this. And I think that's the most important thing is the flavor, the food processing, the motivations, why people eat is way more important than the macro ratios and stuff like that. Yeah, we get so hung up on that. We, you know, we all think we're these scientists with lab coats and we can pick, I'm going to have this much protein and I'm going to have this much fat and this much carbs. And the truth is not even the best scientists can do that without very sophisticated measuring devices. And really we were programmed to eat for just for the enjoyment of it, for the flavor. So, yeah, well, I do have thoughts on, you know, how, what's optimum to eat. And yes, you're talking all about our flavor centers, our reward systems, and all this stuff has been hijacked in the modern food environment. We'll definitely get into that type of thing. But so I guess I got it backwards then that you wrote Dorito Effect second and steak first. I just heard of them in the opposite order. Exactly. Yeah, no, Dorito (laughs) Effect was, I wouldn't say it was the follow-up to steak, but it was where my mind went. It was where the next set of questions were. Steak was a pretty simple book. Where's the best steak? The Dorito Effect was kind of a much deeper dive into how does this all work, this whole food thing, and what's going wrong? Yeah, they kind of had this similar theme. If we want to just give it away, it's that we used to do things a lot better and more naturally, and then all these different processes and food manufacturers and efficiency things came into America, which is how America works and the world works when you want to industrialize and develop your society. But that kind of just ruined steak and it ruined all of our food system and flavors and chicken and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other theme is that nature knows best. For some reason, particularly in North America, we have a what I would consider a very egotistical view. There's something wrong with food and that we're brilliant and we can get in there and fix it all. And the evidence suggests otherwise that we were doing a lot better when we didn't think quite so hard about what was on our plate. We just ate what grew out of the ground or walked on the farm. And the more we've tried to manipulate things, the worse things have gotten. Absolutely. And I just, even with people I know that come to me for nutrition advice, they're looking for like crazy recipes. Like, oh, how do I do this? Like you just eat food. Like I just prepare food. I heat it up. I put some salt on it and then I eat it. Yeah, me too. I should invite you over for dinner because that's exactly what you'd get. (laughs) Well, that'd be great. That's the simple pleasure. That's Well, let's get into it step by step, though. I don't want to just talk about all this high level stuff and just we should go one by one. So how did this started with a Weight Watchers story? Your book is really interesting with Jean Neidich and the woman who started Weight Watchers and how she someone thought she was pregnant. Yeah. I guess she hit her low point when she was, I think she was at a supermarket and somebody asked her when she was due and she was not pregnant, at which point she realized she had a serious problem. 
Uh, the thing that's interesting about it is how long ago this was. I think it was the 1960s. And obesity really wasn't much of a problem back then the way it is now. I think something like 13% of the American population, and it's as we all know, it's ballooned. I mean, it's, it's crazy. She was quite in the minority back then and was moved to start this company. And it's interesting when you think about all the progress we've made against various diseases since then, heart disease, cancer, and so forth, a lot of progress. When it comes to body weight, not only have we hit a wall, like not only are we not making progress, we're actually going backwards. And that's the only major disease I can think of where that's happening. Uh, it's a real head scratcher when you think about it that way. Yeah, I was thinking about it, how it's, it's so correlated, how developed the country is, how many diet books there are, how many people try to calorie count. It's funny that the people with the most obesity are people seem to be trying the hardest. And it's kind of like they're doing the wrong things and missing the things that you and I agree on. I know. And, you know, the other thing I find funny is I'm, I'm kind of an aficionado for old menus and old cookbooks. And it's funny how we have this view that our grandparents and great grandparents were kind of simpletons when it came to nutrition and cuisine and how much more we know than they knew. But if you got into a time machine or even if you just look at photos of like World War II soldiers and things like that, they were so much thinner and so much sprightlier than we are now that it's funny that we that we have this this this, mm. this thought that we somehow know better when it's so clear that something's gone wrong and some and that we're really headed in the wrong direction. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the food lies film I'm making. Basically, it's it's kind of we had it figured out before, and it's funny that modern media is trying to say, oh, these fad diets and all this stuff. It's like, no, I mean, we're talking about just going back to eating how we used to. There's nothing it's not a fad. It's just eating real food and, you know, eating what our ancestors ate. And I mean, start with aurochs, which is part of your steak book. And, you know, the history of, of humans eating meat, which is great because you like readily admit, like, this is a natural thing that humans want to do. This is built into us. We derive pleasure from it. But I think the problem is people don't understand. We don't think it, of it as healthy. I think you mentioned that in the very beginning of steak is that it's not associated with nutrition at all. Like a steak is associated with pleasure. Some people eat only steak. Do you know about these carnivore people? They yeah, I know. I, I've heard about the carnivore diet. It's 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 an interesting one. I haven't tried it, but yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I you know I went into the steak book just looking for the best steak, and I said at the beginning, to me it does matter. But if it meant that the cow had to be tortured or it meant that you were going to die, that doesn't matter. What I'm really looking for is what is the most flavorful steak? What I found, and this was really a life-changing event, was that the most delicious steak was also the steak that was the best for the cow. Let, mm -hmm. You know, the cow led the nicest life. It was the best for me in terms of the nutrition of that steak. And it was also the best for the planet. And that sent a real message that, that we tend to think that things like pleasure and health are, they fight one another. There's that old saying, if it tastes good, spit it out. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. There's a reason food tastes good, and it's because our brain is telling us, this is good, you should eat more of it. And I strongly believe that red meat, you know, when it's raised properly, really is good for you and is a foundation of a healthy diet. I mean, I guess you can go the carnivore route and say it's the only mm -hmm. thing you should eat. I wouldn't go that far. But I definitely think this, this crazy idea we got in our heads that red meat is somehow bad has done so much damage partly because we're not eating something that's good for us but also because it's made us afraid of food that mm -hmm. people walk down the aisles of grocery stores and there's real food you know in the refrigerated display case like steak or ground beef and they're afraid of that they think it's going to kill them and then they go and buy processed food which has got all this stupid writing all over it about being natural use nice colors that seem natural and green and plant-like and it's totally alienated us from what is real and what we should be eating i know you don't follow me on instagram but i it sounds like you're just talking about everything i post about it's so true where, where pleasure and, and health can be the same thing we are hardwired to enjoy these animal foods because they're nutritious for us but we've gone astray but the problem but they, is if you think about it though they have to be because yeah. we evolved. I mean, it's been like a billion years that life has been going on. How could a creature possibly evolve that had these, you know, hedonic, these pleasure-seeking tendencies to kill itself? We wouldn't be here if that were the case. So 
And I talk about steak and, you know, the grocery stores and steakhouse and all that. But where the light bulb really went off was when I went to visit farms and ranches. And the ranchers would say interesting things. There'd be on one field, for example, you'd have the steers. And they'd say, well, those steers, they're in the fattening stage. So they're eating ryegrass. But then over here in this other field, we have the mama cows and they're pregnant and they're feeding on clover because they need protein. And you'd think to yourself, how do they know that? I mean, they don't read a men's journal. They don't Mm -hmm. take courses in nutrition. How is it that a cow, an animal that most humans would think of as being really dumb, know what to eat because they clearly do know what to eat. And there's amazing examples of cows that are deficient in minerals that will actually eat old bones or even dead rabbits. So they have this built-in system for seeking out the nutrition that they need. And when they get it, they like it. It tastes delicious to them. So here I am visiting these ranches where these supposedly dumb cows are eating exactly what they need to eat. And that was just this huge moment where I realized there's something much deeper going on and that this idea that we're all kind of born idiots and we need professionals to guide us to what is right, that, you know, to what we really should be eating is wrong. Our bodies know what we need. Our, our brains have a pretty good idea of what needs to get in the body. Now, we have screwed that up in all sorts of different ways in the last 50 years or so, which we can get into. But the bottom line is, we wouldn't be alive as a species if we did not know how to feed ourselves. 100%. And yeah, we definitely are going to get into all those mistakes we made because some people are like, oh, well, like I crave sugar and bread and this is what I need. No, these modern processed foods. So before that, I want to go back into the animals because that was super interesting. You talked about a guy with the last name Provenza. I forgot his first name. Who Fred, studied yes, sheep. Fred Provenza. Fred, who's right, like, Fred. Um, he's he's a scientist, a retired yeah. scientist at the University or Utah State, pardon me, but also kind of a, a sagely type figure who really changed my life. He, he did some unbelievably interesting work on sheep and goats and proved that they are uncanny in their intelligence, their nutritional wisdom. They know exactly what to eat and exactly what not to eat. So we might drive by these animals on the highway and think these, you know, these dumb critters eating grass or eating bushes, but they are brilliant. And Fred's research is absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, so if they were got a certain virus or something, they would go to the right food yeah, so, that. so that's one of the that's one of the papers he did. He he inoculated sheep with uh, some a, a parasite. Uh, you know, he had a control group where there were sheep that were not inoculated, of course, with the parasite. And what he found was that the sheep that had the parasite went and fed on a particular bark that had some kind of a chemical. I think it was a tannin in it that was hostile to the parasite. They essentially self medicated through eating. Now, the sheep that did not get the parasite did not go and eat this bark. So it's one more example of this, quote, nutritional wisdom where animals can not only feed themselves, but heal themselves through eating. Yeah. And was it in your book or something else that I read where it was the opposite situation where sheep, if they got stuck in a certain paddock or behind a fence and couldn't get the correct variety of nutrient food that they got sick or died. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, Fred's got amazing stories. I didn't actually write about this in the Dorito effect, but he was doing a study where he was trying to make sheep deficient in phosphorus. He couldn't do it. Like he was giving them a diet that had no phosphorus and then he would take blood samples and analyze them. And he's expecting their blood levels of phosphorus to crater. And they're just staying totally level. And he's like, what's going on? These sheep should be getting really, really sick and they're not. So he spends time with the sheep, and what he realizes is that the sheep that are getting this phosphorus-deficient feed are just sticking their heads into the stalls of the other sheep that are getting regular feed, and they're literally drinking their urine and eating their feces, and that's how they're getting their phosphorus. Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, I I mean, how do they know this? (laughs) They don't read. It's, It's built in on some level. It, you know, as soon as you learn this stuff, it just totally changes the way you see food. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't there another one with the, I think it was cows where there was two different types of milk or types of something that they drank and they both smelled the same. They were all similar, but one had different nutrients and the cows went for the right one. 
there are so many examples. I mean, the pile of literature that I have on my desk is is like two feet high of animals that can show this ability, this in, what seems like an instinctive ability to hone in on what they need and to reject what they don't need. You know, to get back to the reason Fred did that phosphorus study was to see what would happen if you actually, you know, manage to make a sheep deficient in phosphorus, what's it going to do? Is it going to sit there and die of a phosphorus deficiency? Well, what he did was he would give them a choice between feed that tasted like coconut or feed that tasted like maple. Now, the feed itself had no phosphorus in it, but here was the trick. If it tasted like maple, he would give a little blast of phosphorus into their stomachs. So mm. their brains would start to associate maple equals phosphorus. So then later on, he'd make them phosphorus deficient. And what would these sheep do? They would seek out the flavor of maple. Uh, so they call this flavor feedback. It's the way the brain learns. Uh, now, there is no phosphorus in, in maple, but the brain learned that there is an association. And that's how we learn what is good for us is every time we eat, our brain kind of captures a flavor image of what we're eating. And then later on, it analyzes what was in that food. And that's how we come to seek out what we need later on. We learn from the past so that we know what to eat in the future. Now, I know what you might say, well, isn't it possible that sheep just like that flavor? Well, being a very good scientist, Fred also reversed it. And so that the I initially the opposite said, group. Yeah. yeah, the opposite group that got so the one flavor was maple. What was the other one I mentioned? I'm, I'm, my brain. Um, coconut. Coconut. So yes, another group. He paired coconut with phosphorus, and those sheep, when they became phosphorus deficient, they sought out the coconut. And here's how good this system is. He found that the amount of let's say coconut flavored feed they would eat was inversely proportional to their blood level of phosphorus. So when they were really low on phosphorus, they would eat a ton of the feed that their brain had been taught had phosphorus in it. So it's a really good system. That's amazing. That's a genius study. It's amazing uh, outcomes too for us to learn about this. Humans actually have this same type of thing where people wonder why they crave a certain food. Well, okay, again, we have to differentiate between craving Doritos and craving oysters. Yes, yeah, so it gets really craving. complicated with humans. Let's not forget that what Fred did was um, he rigged it. And we've rigged our food environment. So we say to ourselves, well, don't humans have this ability? Well, I feel that we do. You know, one thing I'll say, this is how you should think about your eating and your flavor system. If you think of your DNA as your instruction manual to make yourself, the thickest chapter is the one on your food sensing apparatus, which is to say your nose and mouth. That chapter is thicker than the chapter on how to make your eyes or how to make your brains or how to make your sex organs. That is the thickest chapter. So that tells us something that this must be really, really important from an evolutionary point of view to devote that much DNA to it. Here's where we run into a problem. In a state of nature, let's go back, well, 200 years ago, the flavor of food and the nutrients that was contained in those food never changed. Uh, if you took something like a strawberry, a strawberry tasted like a strawberry, and a strawberry had a certain nutritional payload, whatever that was, uh, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals. What changed is that we started to manipulate that. And it all changed in the 1950s with the invention of a device called the gas chromatograph. You know, it's really interesting. When you look at old books written around the 1950s, even cookbooks, it's amazing how much we knew about vitamins, about minerals, you know, the core essentials of, of essential nutrients and so forth. But what we didn't know a thing about was flavor because flavor, it comes in tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. They measure it in parts per million, sometimes parts per billion, sometimes even parts per trillion. So scientists would look at something like a cup of coffee or a fried chicken or a donut and they'd scratch their heads because they'd say, I can tell you what's in there nutritionally but I have no idea what makes that taste the way it does. Well, in comes the gas chromatograph. And it's a pretty, well, I don't want to say it's a simple device, but here's how it works. It would take, let's say you take a strawberry, you volatize some strawberry. So it turns the strawberry into gases. It puts it through a big, long tube. And out the end comes all the chemicals one by one. They've been separated. And you can capture them 
and you can go and analyze them. And that finally let them isolate the flavor chemicals that were in things like strawberries, things like tacos, things like chicken, things like butter and cheese. And then these organic chemists are really smart and they'd say, well, why don't we just make these things ourselves? And that's what they did. This was the birth of the flavor industry. So one of the first things they did, for example, is they found out what are some of the key flavor components in butter. Let's go manufacture those and let's stick them in margarine. And then we can say margarine literally tastes more like butter. And people go and buy margarine and taste like butter. And well, they think life is great. I'm eating margarine, tastes like butter. But we've rigged things. We changed this relationship between flavor and nutrition. Uh, and the reason I called the book The Dorito Effect is because I think the invention of the Dorito is the best example of not only how that changed, but how powerful this technology is in terms of getting us to eat stuff. It really is. And a lot of people in the nutrition world talk about this. They talk about the scientists and hyper palatability and these food scientists are paid to make you addicted to food and the food companies. It's like their whole job is to get you to eat more. And and this is kind of what, what it all comes down to is, is you're kind of in the book talking about why and how this happened and how it works. Exactly. But here's where I would differ with the scientists because most of the scientists talk about hyper palatability again come back to macronutrients. They talk about things like sugar, salt, fat. Now, I'm not saying that has nothing to do with it. I think that stuff is in the mix. Oh, yeah. But I think if we look at the invention of the Dorito, it really tells us a lot. So I just want to tell that story because it's kind of dear to my heart, but I think it's also very illustrative. Um, and it all starts out with a guy named um, Arch West. He, this guy like could have walked off the set of Mad Men. He was an ad guy in New York City. And in the late 1950s, he gets a call from the Frito Company uh, they made corn chips and they said, do you want to be our new director of sales and marketing? So he moves his family to Texas. And shortly after that, he takes his kids and his wife on a trip out west to California. It, kind of interesting. While he was there, he actually met Ray Kroc, uh, the guy behind McDonald's, an incidental meeting that had, had absolutely nothing to do with McDonald's mm -hmm. or Doritos. It's just these two titans of industrial food just happened to meet one day. Totally incidental, has nothing to do with the story, but I feel like I must mention it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a few days after that, Arch is driving towards San Diego where he passes what his daughter describes as a little Mexican shack by the side of the road. And he's the kind of guy who's like, he's got to try it. He's got to see what's there. And he tastes for the first time a tortilla chip. And the director of sales and marketing for the Frito Company, which would soon join with the Lay's chip company to become Frito-Lay, the VP of sales and marketing says, I think the tortilla chip is our next big thing. So he goes back to Dallas where Frito-Lay is located. He gets kind of the, the company brass together and he gives them these tortilla chips. And he even came up with a name for them. It's a name that in a very bastardized pigeon Spanish means little pieces of gold. He gave them Doritos. And they were just like, what is this? These kind of taste like Fritos. Why would anybody want this? But he managed to get them to market. He, in fact, took money that he... Well, they initially didn't him. want him. What's that? Right? They initially turned him down. Yeah, initially they turned him down. So he's like... Yeah. He was so sure that he was right that he took money he was supposed to spend on other stuff and developed this Dorito concept and finally got the green light. And Doritos finally hit the market in the early 1960s. And guess what? The other guys at Frito-Lay were right. They bombed. Nobody really got Doritos. The complaint was, this snack sounds Mexican, but it doesn't taste Mexican. Mm. So Arch West has to go and face his company, you know, his, his peers, probably feeling a little dumb at this point. And they say, what are you going to do about Doritos? And his answer to them is, I'm going to make them taste like taco. And this elicited laughter. And one of his peers said, our Yankee friend from the North doesn't know the difference between a thing and a flavor. And the guy was right because up until that point, they, in nature, they were bound. Things tasted like what they were. But Arch West was on the cusp of technology and he knew that thanks to this thing called the gas chromatograph flavor, I mean, we can make anything taste like what we want. So they came out with taco flavored Doritos and they were a hit a snack that nobody wanted to eat, 
very quickly became a snack that people could not stop eating. I mean, everybody knows what Doritos are. Now, I want you to think about this too. Nutritionally speaking, there is no difference between an original Dorito, which is just a tortilla chip, and a flavored Dorito. The only difference is the flavor chemicals. There's no calories there. It's the chemicals that make you eat. This is such a seminal moment in the history of food because we found with just this simple dusting of chemicals that are measured in such tiny, tiny amounts, we could take a food that a human would be like, yeah, I don't really want to eat that and turn that into something where we literally crave them, where we can't stop eating them. It's insane. Yeah, did they do studies like that? Because you can imagine if you get a bowl of plain chips and then you, you have to all the two groups and then you have the bowl of Dorito chips and see how many people eat. If that's a great question. I, I don't know if they've done that study. I mean, I know I've done it personally. <laughs> yeah. You know, I go to like, um, I got kids and you'll go to a birthday party or something. There's a bowl of Doritos. And I always tell myself like, no, I'm not going to have any Doritos. And I'm like, okay, I'll have one. Uh-huh. And then as soon as you have one, it's, it's like you're drawn to it. It's this magnetic attraction. You can't get it out of your head. Even knowing what I know, being the guy who wrote the Bro. Dorito effect, <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting there fighting this like, holy crap, I can't stop eating these things. Well, it's it's <laughs> the science is real and they're good at, at making this. They stuff. know what they're doing. Clearly. They know what they're doing. So, OK, we, we need to go back to why humans don't exactly have these nutrient sense. Well, we do have these nutrient sensing mechanisms. But for one thing, you write about that the only one we vitamin or mineral we can even taste is basically sodium and ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, like sour flavor. Yes. You know, scientists would call them flavor feedback mechanisms. And yeah, so we don't have a sensor for things like uh, the B vitamins or or many of these things. By the way, neither do these sheep or any of these other animals. Exactly. Um, it's the body state that is produced. The brain knows when the body's sick and the brain knows when the body's healed. And the brain also knows what got the body from the state of sickness to the state of being healed. So it does the math. So I put it to you this way. You know, we have sensors that can detect the color red, for example, but I don't need a Ferrari sensor to tell you that there's a Ferrari parked in front of my house. Mm -hmm. Our brain can do the computation. So that's the way it works with um, food and flavor and these various bodily states. We don't need a sensor for every nutrient or every plant compound out there. Our brains can do the math. What we need, you know, if we want to be healthy, is just food that just doesn't lie to us food that delivers on its promise that basically it is what it tastes like Mm -hmm. this is kind of your main thesis which is the problem with obesity and all these overeating is that the flavors trick us into thinking we're getting nutrients but we're not exactly and there's some very simple ways of thinking about this uh let's think about sugar sweetened beverages Uh, we all know this is a huge problem Soda consumption is going down, but it's still huge. I mean, there's still like a staggering percentage of Americans that drink like six or more sodas a day, which blows my mind because I don't think I have six in a year or maybe in a decade. Well, let's take Coca-Cola, for example. If you took the flavorings out of Coca-Cola, you'd be left with carbonated water with a lot of sugar in it. Mm -hmm. Would people drink that drink? I don't think they would. I have made that drink at home. It's really not very interesting to drink. It's the flavorings that give it the zip, literally that drinkability. And the processed food aisle is full of that. If we took the flavorings out of so many of these things, would we eat them? And my answer is no. We, I mean, maybe we did a little bit of them, but we wouldn't. You might drink that sugar water if you'd just done like a 10-mile a run and mm-hmm. you're really thirsty and you're really in need of calories. Then your body might go like, yeah, I need this stuff. But ordinarily, you wouldn't go near it because you'd think, I I just don't need these calories and this isn't particularly tasty or interesting. It's the flavor chemicals that hook us, that pull us in. And once we're in, we're stuck. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's baked into our evolution is that before when we tasted delicious flavors, it meant that they were packed with nutrients, like a very well-raised chicken or a or, or good uh, fruit. I, I, good fruit, fruit exactly. I always think of uh, peaches at their peak in the summertime, how unbelievably delicious they are. They just grab hold of you. It's like a drug-like experience. They're really good for you. You know, we never celebrate the fact that there's some really awesomely delicious, healthy food. But that's why we know that there is good stuff in there. And then 
we came around and faked our body into thinking we're getting it. So that yeah, no, that's precisely it. Then someone said, "Well, why don't we just take that peach flavor and just stick it into sugar water, and no one will know better." And the truth is, no one does know better. I mean, I think on one level, it's immoral. It's also really troubling. I was visiting one of these flavor companies, and they were showing me how they made a fake cinnamon flavor, and they were putting it in a cereal. And they and they showed me. They said, "These are the chemicals that make this delicious." And I said to them. You know, does this concern you at all? Do you think this could be part of the obesity epidemic that people are making bad food choices because we're manipulating the flavor of food? And the answer I got was what people eat is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like what the cigarette companies used to say that, you know, we just make cigarettes. If you want to smoke, well, that's just up to you, but we just make cigarettes. And that was essentially their response is we just make the food. If you want to eat it, that's up to you. That's not my problem. It clearly isn't that simple. Um, and they clearly know that they are dealing with chemicals and, that affect our brains in ways that limit our ability to control our own behavior. It's just a really hard topic, though, because, yeah, I mean, we, we're a free society and it's capitalism and all this. But I don't know. What do you do about that, though? It's like, can I have some kind of ice cream once a year? Like, is that a problem once a month? Yeah, you that's know. a good question. I mean, I eat ice cream. I mean, you can make ice cream with real ingredients. Oh, um, I do that too, actually, yeah. And I think it's great. And I mean, walk down the ice cream aisle and look at the ingredients. Uh, some of them are just cream. No cream, sugar, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and fruit. Those don't scare me so much. Yes, they're very rich. There's a lot of calories. I think but, that's okay. I, I don't think no, no, calories no. are deadly. I don't think but we'd it, be here if not for calories. It's such a fine line between allowing companies to make foods and then, but having them be detrimental, you know what I mean? It's a super hard question. I'm not saying you need a good answer, but it's like, should it, I don't want to like tax people or make foods illegal. No, I agree. And I don't think you could. I mean, I don't think the, the legislative approach, even if it could work, I think it would literally take hundreds of years because there would be so many lawsuits. And we live in a free country where, you know, are you really allowed to tell someone you're not allowed to eat this? Mm -hmm. uh, even if we tried to do that, these companies are so powerful that the amount of, you know, dollars that will be flowing into various, um, you know, centers, like bank yeah, yeah, yeah. or the, uh, what do you call those people that advocate for lobbying. lobbyists? There you go. The lobbyists. I think it comes down to a question of attitude, just a personal attitude thing is, am I going to eat food that is real or am I going to eat food that is fake? It's a really simple way of seeing food. Nobody really looks at it that way, but I think if, if we did, it would make eating much, much simpler. You know, I gave a talk at a girl's school the other day. Uh, no, it was more like a year ago. What am I saying? And I got to sit down with a group of students that were in 12th grade. And so many of them were telling me with such great pride that they'd given up red meat, but they were eating these like banana chips fried in coconut oil after school. And I, I was just blown away because for certain biological reasons, females need iron when they're in their reproductive stage. But also, where do they get in their heads that banana chips fried in oil is healthy just because it's mm -hmm. like coconut oil? I mean, it's refined coconut oil for one yeah, thing. Yeah, it seems natural. Well, it's just good marketing. It seems natural. And, and they were so sure that they had made such a wise and healthy choice. And I thought, God, we are so far away from, from just eating food. That's kind of my main message. And I've talked to over 150 people in the past couple of years, making this film, doing this podcast, all this stuff. And in, yeah, there's all kinds of thoughts and people are doing different macros. People have plant versus animal wars, but the real, real thing that it all boils down to is eating the real food, but that's not like a sexy message. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, all right, so I should just make a film that says eat real food. And people are like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of know that. But it's like you have to convince them. I guess the the magic is talking through all these nuances and getting them to realize, and the science, to realize why they need to eat real food. Well, yeah, there's two things. There's the why we need to. And also, if you want to make it sexy, talk about how incredibly delicious real food actually is. And this is what most people don't understand. And I think the best example is probably chicken. I would say... You know, I don't know your audience, but I would say 98, 99, maybe 99.9% .9 of people listening have never experienced the real taste of chicken uh, because we have so corrupted the way we raise chickens. In the 1940s, a chicken in today's dollars would cost around 30 bucks. Mm. 
and it would have taken around 16, 18, maybe 20 weeks to raise. And it would have lived outside. It would have gotten chicken feed, but it would have also been eating like, you know, grasshoppers and clover and all the stuff that they eat in the barnyard. And it would have, it looked very different from today's chicken, a very small breast, very big legs. We cooked them differently. They had to be cooked lower and slower, more like cooking a brisket than cooking a steak, to, you know, to put in those terms. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, we have bred chickens to the point that it now takes about between six and seven weeks to raise a way bigger chicken. They live indoors and they eat a processed diet of carbs and protein and all the right vitamins and minerals that they grow super, super fast, super quick. And chicken is cheap. You can get like a whole chicken for eight bucks and it has no flavor. It doesn't taste anything like the way chicken used to taste. How I discovered this, like I mentioned earlier, I I love old cookbooks. And when you look at old cookbooks, you look at recipes for fried chicken. I love fried chicken. And you look at a recipe and it would just say, you know, liberally coat with salt and pepper, dredge and flour and fry, you know, in, in like a cast iron pan. And you're like, what? Like there's no garlic powder. You didn't brine it. There's no chipotle yeah, yeah. dip or whatever. You're like, you guys sound like total idiots. Um, you, you know, you had no taste buds. You, you were simpletons. But then I got hold of one of these heirloom chickens, a, a fryer chicken, which is to say a male chicken that was killed around the age of 12 weeks. It's like a small chicken. We're talking like two pounds. It doesn't look like a chicken. It looks like a dead bird is what it looks like. And I cooked it that way. And when I tasted that chicken, I was blown away. It was a deep, intense chicken explosion in my mouth. It was so, so good. And when you compare that chicken to what we're eating now, the stuff we're eating now is like toilet paper soaked in lukewarm water. It has no flavor. That's why we have to work so hard. You look at a modern recipe like Thomas Keller, you, know, you got to brine it for like two days and then you got to blitz it with all these spices, then do this and that. And, you know, I call that Dorito chicken. Yeah, you can make that chicken palatable. You can mm-hmm. give it crunch. You can make it tasty. But that's not how chicken was meant to be. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, that chicken doesn't get anywhere close to being as tasty as an heirloom chicken. Or nutritious. And yeah, you could oh, get... Yeah, or, yeah, or <laughs> nutritious. We haven't even gotten into that. I mean, you can tell just by looking at those chickens. Those heirloom chickens have yellow fat. The stuff they've been eating, the grasshoppers, the clover, it gets inside them. They literally are what they eat. And guess what? So are we. Absolutely. The the nutrients are so different. So this goes into the same thing of efficiency and modernization. And it's half the time for whatever percent more weight. It's just like no nutrients in the meat and just filled with water even. Well, no, 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 not just water. If you look and go out there and do this, look at the ingredient panel on whole chickens. You'll see that they have chicken brine in them and even chicken flavoring. They have to make chicken taste like chicken mm. because they know that on its own, it's just sort of like neutral protein. I mean, it's not all that different from tofu. It's just, you know, you think of, if you bought a, a boneless, skinless chicken breast today and just boiled it, there'd be like nothing. It's just total neutrality on your tongue. Like there's just zero happening. Well, it's like people who like, they say they love chicken. I'm like, no, you love fried barbecue sauce flavor. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you don't no, love the totally, chicken. Yeah, totally correct. 100%. Yeah, yeah. It's, the chicken is just this vehicle for the flavoring. I mean, you could put that on tofu. You could put that on a potato chip. It would still work. What they're after is that crunch and the flavoring. You got it exactly right. They don't like and, chicken. They don't know what chicken tastes like. I think yeah. they'd be blown away if they tasted actual chicken. Yeah. And it's funny too. Some people, they're obsessed with coffee. And then I look at what they're drinking. Like, you don't like coffee. You like cream and sugar. Like, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or like milk, caramel. Or coffee flavored milkshakes. Yeah. It's like, if you just, I mean, I drink black coffee and I appreciate coffee and it took me, you know, a couple of years to get there, right. I, from not liking it to liking cream and sugar to enjoying the flavor of it straight. Yeah. It's definitely a journey. And well, I, I wouldn't say your taste buds change. Your taste buds don't change. Your brain is what changes. But the way I, not that I was ever a terrible eater, but the way I eat now is so different than the way I used to in terms of being able to identify and just know intuitively that this food has got something really good in it and it's really delicious on a a kind of a profound level where there's this all this other junk food, which is just like pop music. It's it's like an earworm. It just sort of 
yeah, you keep eating it, but is it really good? No. Would anyone, mm-hmm. even though we all suffer from this problem that we can't stop eating things like Doritos, would we ever say that, you know, that's the best food I've ever had? Like, not for a second. We know it's junk food. It just tricks us into, you know, that habit where you just keep going back and back and back. Yeah. And I want to go back to you talking about the audience. My audience, luckily, many of them probably have tasted real chicken because, you know, a lot of them are into raising their own animals. They have backyard chickens or they they shop at their farmer's market from regenerative farms. Well, that's and, great. And I, I apologize. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> but Unreservedly for insulting them. <laughs> but no, no, but maybe not, that's all maybe only a fraction because most people, you know, they want to do that, but they don't actually do it. And and well, also, and here's the other thing: it's it's really tough to get a real chicken because sometimes you go to the f- uh, farmer's market and they say they have a pasture chicken, but what they've done is raised a modern bird, quote, mm. on pasture, and that's not the same thing. You need the old genetics. You need um, a bird like a barred rock or a Rhode Island red or a buckeye, and you need that's to raise mean. the old genetics the old way. Those chickens are actually pretty hard to find. Now I'm sure some of your viewers have found them. But just buying a pastured chicken is no guarantee of chicken flavor. Yeah. Well, then also to tell you something about my audience is most of them just just eat a lot of red meat. They've figured out that red meat is healthy and chicken is not on their top priority because the way we raise chickens is not healthy. And, it, you know, it is not very nutritious meat and it's very high in omega-6 because they're fed like these fake foods super like you're talking high. about. Super yeah. high. Yeah, so, super high. Tons of corn. But so I mentioned it for a second, I do have my own grass fed meat company and just we have actual chicken, the heritage breed and raised on the correct foods. We actually give them a high omega-3 diet. So it's actually a very high omega-3 profile. Yes, it's expensive. And yes, they're smaller. And it's because it takes twice as long to raise them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. Everyone gets upset about that. They're like, well, these chickens are more expensive. And I'm like, well, usually, you know, a better car is more expensive than a crappy car. Nobody gets upset about that. Mm-hmm. For some reason, like you raise the price of someone's food by 50 cents and they lose their temper. That's a stunner to me. Uh, the other interesting thing, by the way, about your chickens, I don't know if you knew this, but chickens are one of the very few terrestrial animals that can actually turn simple omega-3s like alpha linolenic acid, ALA, which is considered, you know, the simple Uh, Omega-3. I think it's actually great, but some people think it's sort of the junk omega-3. I think that's totally wrong. But anyway, chickens can actually turn that into DHA, which is the omega-3 you get in salmon. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting thing about chickens that other terrestrial, you know, farm animals can't do. So you're getting some of that salmon oil in your chickens that you're raising. I don't know if you're that's, aware of that. Oh, that's interesting. I actually didn't get down to that detail. Yeah, DHA is is the usable form, and that's what vegans need in their life is some some DHA because you can't get it from plant foods. No, you cannot. I mean, if you comb the ocean, you might find the right kind of algae, but I don't think humans were designed to do that. Yeah. yeah. So – I want to go back to just the nutrition. Have you looked at the science behind humans needing certain nutrients? And if they don't get them, they keep eating, right? That's just kind of like the protein leverage hypothesis. If you heard that is that humans require a certain amount of protein and they'll eat until they get that. And most of our foods in our modern food environment are diluted with carbs, sugars, oils, and all this other stuff and diluted out the protein, which is the most expensive part. So obviously these food companies want to take it out. And so one theory of the obesity, if you have diluted protein, you're not eat until you get enough protein. So you're eating tons of extra foods. So it's the same kind of thing with the flavor and the nutrients. Another hypothesis about why people gain weight is sort of like the nutrient leverage hypothesis is that we don't have enough nutrients. So we keep eating till we try to get enough. Yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, If you look at nutrition as a study, 100 years ago, we were trying to figure out how to stop babies from getting rickets or or curing sailors of scurvy. Now we have a very different problem, obviously. It's, It's the problem is not starvation. The problem is too much. You could look at it as kind of a a mirrored version of the protein leverage hypothesis. You could also just look at it this way, is that our brain learns from eating good stuff, like let's say berries or whatever, that there's good stuff in here. And when we then take that sheen of nutrition and put it where it shouldn't be, like a milkshake or candy, our brain doesn't realize it's been duped. So 
is it because it's seeking nutrients it's not getting? That's a possibility. Or is it because we've just created something that the brain thinks of as a prize that, oh, what a wonderful thing. And I think this is something we don't know the answer to yet that we need to figure out. Mm. Well, it's kind of like both. It's like a push pull thing where it's, it's the flavors drive us to eat more. And then we're also, yeah, and then you're not satisfied, right? You're, you're not ultimately satisfied, not satisfied yeah. by these foods. And that, then that drives you to eat more again. And you confuse yourself again with more flavor. You know, it's really interesting when you think so many of the processed carbs that we eat are savory. They're kind of made to taste meaty. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying they taste exactly like meat, but those first Doritos tasted like taco. Mm -hmm. Well, tacos have meat in them. Yeah. Why are we making carbs taste like meat, like, like they have protein? I just don't think that's a good idea. That's amazing. I never thought about it to that level. That's We're d taking the protein out or not having it in the first place and then tricking people. I, I think that's huge is why you overeat because your body wants protein and it loves a well, savory. So, yeah. So, I, you know, imagine you and I are on a road trip or something and we get hungry and we go into the service station. Well, and we have two options. We could buy a big bag of, uh, let's say, you know, potato chips or Doritos, meaty flavored, savory, or we could buy some beef jerky. Well, the first thing is the beef jerky bag would be way smaller, but I think it would be way more satisfying. I mean, I love foods like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember having biltong in South Africa. Oh, yeah. And how incredibly delicious it. it was, but also how satisfying it was. You just have a few pieces. Like after lunch, you're a little peckish. You have a couple pieces of biltong and you you're are good. done, man. You are like you don't need to eat until 11 o'clock at night. Well, that's the thing is if you people making these decisions at a convenience store, it's way cheaper to get the chips. The chips are like a dollar fifty. The these beef jerky bags are like seven dollars, you know, for like some small little bag. So I can see this all factors in too, is people they for one love that, you know, I can eat like a million chips and crunch and snack on them. Yeah, they think it's a better deal. Like, why would I get yeah. ripped off and buy the beef jerky when I can get such an amazing deal on the chips, which is like a big bag of air with some chips in it, by the way. <laughs> like, yeah, it sounds like, OK, I have my I love talking to all these different people because everyone has their sort of big model of obesity. It's like, how did we get fat and sick? And, you know, the Gary Tobbs will say it's the sugar. And he had in a great book about sugar and why it it caused a lot of things, but I don't think that's it or there's more to the story. There's some holes in that. Or Other people talk about protein leverage. So it sounds like yours is, do you kind of have like the flavor model of obesity or the processed food Ooh. and added flavor model of obesity? Is that your yeah, thing? Yeah, well, it's funny you mention that. I'm working on a follow-up to the Dorito effect that really does look at the question of obesity and it takes a lot of the stuff I look at the Dorito effect and dives down even deeper on kind of on a neuroscience level. So, you know, we'll get a chance to talk about that. That, that won't be for about a year, but I would say when you look at the Dorito, what I call the Dorito effect, I, I would just put it this way. We weren't wired to go seeking out particular nutrients like cavemen going, I need sugar. I need carbohydrates. That's not what the human animal I is. I need magnesium. Like I, I need, need to find some magnesium. We were designed to crave the foods that brought us what we need. The mechanism was the flavor. And flavor is what's changed. Since the 1950s, the flavor of whole foods, things like chickens, tomatoes, strawberries, have been getting progressively blander and blander. This isn't news to anyone. Try eating a supermarket tomato. It's like eating styrofoam. At the same time, the flavor of the foods we know we should not be eating the processed foods have been getting ever more delicious and irresistible. So when you look at it that way, when you look at how we change flavor, this incentive to eat, the way we were programmed to eat, is this really a surprise that we're eating the wrong food? I mean, it's a perfect storm. We've basically said, let's make the good food taste like crap and the crap <laughs> food taste amazing. Or, well, I wouldn't say, I, I, sh I should correct that. It doesn't taste amazing. It tastes in such a way that you just can't stop eating it. Yeah, and when well, you look at what we've done to the flavor of food, to me, it's like no brainer. That's how you create obesity. That's a great way to look at it, and I'm trying to like get people to think that way. And and yeah, it, it doesn't taste amazing. It's like people like Taco Bell, but it's like if you had a perfect steak, you would always choose the perfect steak because the Taco Bell is good, maybe, but it's not amazing. It's not. Am By the way, you can get a lot of the ingredients of these big fast food companies. They have to publish their ingredients. They're using these flavors too. They use artificial flavors, but also look for the word natural flavor. 
everyone sees the word natural flavor and they think, oh, it's natural. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything's okay. It's not. That is as deceptive marketing as, as anything you'll find. All that word natural means is the way they made it. But very often an artificial flavor and a natural flavor are chemically the exact same chemical. The word natural just refers to how you made it. So it's not just the junk food aisle. It's also fast food companies that are putting these flavor chemicals into foods because they want you to buy their food. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I want to talk about that natural flavor. And it's part of this marketing where, well, I know, I'm, well, I'm thinking of a specific woman who thinks that if Whole Foods makes it, it's healthy. She thinks you can just, if it's in this, the store, Whole Foods, you are going to be a health superhero. And I just want to tell people and get this message across, a ton of this is marketing. It's like, oh, this is like natural agave and it's like natural flour, natural this. And you're just getting a natural donut. You know what I mean? I don't care if it's made with agave and natural flavorings. This is marketing talk. It's loopholes like you're talking about. You're speaking from my Bible. <laughs> I, I'm sure you've handled it. One thing I'm interested in right now is this fake meat or whatever plant-based meat, whatever that actually means. I mean, isn't grass-fed meat also plant-based? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, get, I find it all confusing. But um, I did. A, I was appeared on the Dr. Oz show because... I think it was Beyond Meat has now created this kind of crumbly fake pork. And everyone was going on about how, how real it tastes. And I said, but guys, doesn't this concern you? I mean, they have taken, okay, it originated at some point with a plant, but they've processed the living hell out of it and created this product that they had to add all these flavorings to to get you to eat it. Doesn't that alarm you? That if it wasn't for these chemicals, you wouldn't go near the stuff. Nobody asks those questions. I don't know why. It blows me away. They just think like it tastes good. It must be fine. It's, it's quote, plant-based. What the heck does that mean? I mean, morphine is plant-based. Arsenic is plant-based. I can't like, get started with plant-based. <laughs> yeah, I can't get my head around that either. Yeah, these fake anyway. foods. I actually spoke at a food industry conference where every all those companies were there and they were talking and all the presentations were on all the fake meats and the lab meats and beyond meat. And I was the one person, I'm glad they had me talking about the other side. And I was talking about how we need to eat more real meat and how it can help the environment if it's raised properly and that we should not be trying to eat a yeah, 32 ingredient slop. Well, good for you for doing that. But the other thing that galls me is that people don't see what's really going on is just a big money play. There is tons of money at work here. There are billionaires that will be minted what I can't believe is that, you know, it's happened with vaping. Everyone mm -hmm. thought vaping's, you know, smoking's terrible, but vaping's great, right? It's got to be better than smoking. Mm -hmm. So we start vaping. And then like three years later, they're removing lungs from 16 year olds who've been vaping too much. Mm -hmm. What we do is we mistake not having a record for having a clean record. We have no idea what the effect of this fake meat is going to have. We've only just started eating it, but we assume it must be better than what we've been eating for hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, the logic is so twisted and stupid, but everyone's going for it. Well, be, they're all going for a few things. And one of them is being that, like you said, billionaires will be minted. These guys that are the CEOs of the Beyond Meat, they're using amazing marketing methods to convince people that it's the way to go. Yeah, I, I know. And I think also they're taking advantage of the fact that we have become so alienated from actual food that we're willing to jump whole hog. You know, I'm a journalist. Um, there's less and less journalism these days because, you know, the money's literally evaporated from it. But the thing that bothered me the most about the all these fake meats was the, the zeal and the joy that these, like, young 26-year-old journalists were like, finally, you know, mm -hmm. I can have a burger and feel good about it. And I'm sitting there going, like, there's no research behind this. How do you know this is good for you? They, just because they made it, quote, bleed? Again, I, I can't figure it out. And, and at the same time, these people are convinced that foods that we know, you know, older Homo sapiens and even the species that preceded us ate, well, they're convinced this must be deadly. They're so sure of it. Our modern society is a mess. So that's kind of the problem, especially this younger generation. Yeah, these new reporters in their 20s, they just have totally bought into this plant-based propaganda world. Yeah, I have this whole community trying to do the opposite. And some of them are carnivores. I'm friends with a lot of these popular carnivore people. They, they kind of need to go to this extreme 
to combat all this stuff. It's not like they're eating only meat to just combat them. They actually are getting a lot healthier and, you know, by cutting out tons of processed foods and eating, yes, yeah, a foundational human health food. But yeah, I mean, we need to go on this. It's basically a battle now because now they're trying to take meat away or tax meat. There's all these ideas in, in different countries that are kind of infringing on people's freedom to even eat these foods. Yeah, it's almost religious because there's so much zeal, but they judge you and they they judge you as being impure and kind of unholy to the point that that you need to be controlled, that we need to get hold of you and make sure you don't eat the wrong stuff. They don't realize a lot of it, too, is, you know, driven by animal welfare and they don't know what modern industrialized farming looks like. But when you're growing acres and acres and acres and acres and acres of soybeans you are denying that land to the animals that would have lived there and eaten there and thrived there. So all those people eating these, quote, plant-based, you know, burgers that have this fake blood, they've got real blood all over them, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking, because they there's all sorts of insecticides. They do everything to keep actual animals from eating this stuff. So, you know, if you're going to live and breathe on this planet, it comes at the price of some other creature not living and breathing. That's just how it works. I mean, we live in a world of finite resources. The sun is free. Everything else is a fight. I guess they have it in their head that that you can have this fairy tale where you can eat this plant-based food and everyone holds hands and sings songs. <laughs> the animals are happy. Um, it's so dumb. Hey, well, okay. Like, do these people ever leave the city? Do they, do they know yeah. what nature's like? I mean, here's the other thing. They yeah. think it's mean to kill an animal. Okay, so I guess they've never really visited a real modern industrial slaughterhouse. They're very well run. They're designed by people like Temple Grandin so that the mm -hmm. animals experience yeah. no stress. Guess what? Out there in nature, when animals die, they don't die surrounded by their family and close their eyes and drift off into the great beyond. It's really, really nasty. They get eaten. They get torn apart by wolves or they fall through the ice and drown or they starve to death or they freeze to death. If I were to choose to weigh a, to die, it would be in a modern slaughterhouse. You know, I'd take that absolutely before, you know, wasting away in the plains or, or getting ripped apart by carnivores. A hundred percent. And you are speaking my language. I just had John and Molly from The Biggest Little Farm, which is a great documentary film. And they talked about this exact same thing. There's so many deaths and a toll on nature and just to grow crops. And they people think that it's this cruelty free thing. I got to send you this video of what we shot with a woman near you in, uh, in the Toronto area. Her name is Tara Couture and she is an amazing person that I talk about on every podcast. I think that's my new goal just to bring her up on every podcast. But uh, people, if they haven't seen my YouTube channel, Food Lies YouTube channel, just, and I want to send it to you because she had some amazing words that mirror what you're saying. She calls it a vegan plate of food. It's death on a plate. There's just no blood. And she yeah. is, that's a great it, way of putting it. It's amazing. And she, she raises all her own animals on her farmstead and we shot with her and it has all this amazing drone footage of her and her husband. And I just want everyone to check it out. I want you to check it out. But, uh, so, well, you know, the, the other interesting thing too, this is gonna sound really weird, but our fear of death is also interesting in all this. Um, when I wrote steak, I raised my own heifer. I got a, a particular breed, a very rare breed called a Canadian. Uh, you can hardly find them anymore. They're an old dairy breed similar to a Jersey. And I fattened her on grass and apples. And when it came to that slaughter day, it was a tough day for me. Or at least I thought it was going to be a tough day. I remember getting to the farm at like 5.30 in the morning and it was so dark. I couldn't see. I walked into the barn. I couldn't see anything. And I had to use my cell phone. And, and there suddenly in front of me, there she was. And because it was slaughter day, I, I bought all this like craft beer and filled a bucket and gave her this big slurp <laughs> of beer and brought her to the slaughterhouse. And I thought it was gonna be a massively traumatic experience for me. And what I realized is that pain and stress is what is painful, but death is a release. Mm. Um, she was there one minute and then gone the next. There was no pain. It was, I don't wanna say it was a beautiful experience, but it really changed my understanding about the line between life and death. And it's not what we think it is. and. Any creature that is born, including everyone listening to this podcast, is going to die. And we need to understand that death is a part of life and that you can't escape that, even if you're eating plant-based foods. It's pain and it's stress and it's suffering that are the true enemies. That's exactly right. And 
you know what's funny is that this woman, Tara, is writing a book on death. And she thinks this is the biggest problem that our world is facing is being scared of death, not being connected with nature and realizing that this is a cycle of life and death and for something to live, something must die. And you guys should probably just get connected. You both are (laughs) writers and you both live up there. But Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. And just, just so everyone knows, Toronto is not some city where everyone's you know, it's super at peace with death. I think this is some kind of coincidence, but it sounds like I should uh, make contact with this person. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to get a few more details too. Like I just had some random stuff that I jotted down, like, like MSG. We talked about non-caloric chemicals and flavoring. I feel like this is a big question that I even have and that a lot of people have. Is it good or bad? You know? Well, yeah, MSG, that's an interesting one. So there's some people who think MSG, like it gets into your brain and it it does really bad things. And I'm not part of that camp. I think it gets broken down by the body and I don't think it will, um, I don't think it's acutely toxic. But here's what MSG does do, is it makes food more tasty. Mm-hmm. Um, if you put MSG on potato chips or, or you, Chinese food or whatever, it's going to make it more tasty and you're going to eat more of it. And that is a problem because obesity is our problem. So Mm -hmm. I am a critic of MSG in that sense. I don't think it's toxic and cancer causing. I just think it's going to make you eat food you wouldn't eat. Mm. Yeah. I'm super in agreement there. I love some people. I think it's a problem when you get in the nutrition world and everyone's, there's a lot of hand waving. It's like, oh my God, it's MSG. It's terrible. It's this chemical. But I 100% agree that it's going to cause you to overeat and that it's bad in that way. I don't like when people get too obsessed and saying it's a neurotoxin or this or that. Right. You kind of go overboard. You know, it's interesting because people think that uh, processed foods are so full of, quote, chemicals. But the truth is, if you want to count the chemicals, it's natural food that has the chemicals. There's like 2000 chemicals that they found in strawberries. When you look at a bag of uh, potato chips, there's nothing close to that complexity. Everything is a chemical. So this chemophobia that we have, this chemical enters my body, it will kill me. A, it's wrong, but B, I think it's it's the wrong approach. It really clouds our thinking and frightens us and, you know, stops us from seeing things as they are. Wow. Okay. I didn't know you thought this. This is exactly what I think, and it's super unpopular in any world, whether it be the nutrition world or not, because everyone loves to say, oh, it's stuffed with chemicals, stuffed with chemicals, all these foods. And I used to think that, but when I started getting into this more and talking to tons of people and researching myself... The processed foods, the problem is hyperpalatability. They've, they've been denuded of chemicals is Denu- really what yeah. happened. They've taken something natural that was just bursting with chemicals and they refined it to the point that it's like, like a white powder or something. And then they can add just the few little chemicals they want that are going to make you eat it. That's how it works. Well, yes. So it's not the chemicals and it's not just a hyperpalatability. It's the dilution of essential nutrients and protein and stuffing in a bunch of refined flour, sugars, and oils. I mean, that's the main thing. And even just the act of processing, which I've gotten interested in, which is you're grinding up flour into the smallest form and sugar that it interacts with your gut differently. And there's all these different chemicals or hormones released and all this stuff going on in your body. And that's the problem. The problem isn't some chemical or preservative exact, you know what I mean? It's the act of processing physically it's all those stuffed in extra sugars, refined oils, and it's a lack of nutrients and protein. Yeah, and the lack of complexity. And I think that's the word there, which is the problem is complexity, is people want to boil this down into something really simple, like it's one chemical. There's this one thing I need to do. I just need to drink this magic coffee, or I just need to avoid no this one chemical. Yeah. If I just avoid MSG, I'm set. Yeah, and it's, it's just not that simple. Nature is so complex Uh, We don't understand it. Uh, We think we do. We don't even understand. Like I said, there's 2,000 chemicals in strawberries. That's just the ones we've counted. There's ones we we haven't even figured out yet. And I think part of the problem with nutrition is that we want it to be simple. And the the fact of the matter is, it isn't. That's why there's all this DNA, you know, devoted to making this nutrient-sensing part of your body. Now, you can make it simple by just eating real food, and that's a simple approach. But as far as coming up with these simple diagnoses of what's gone wrong. Like it's just this chemical or it's just that it just isn't that simple. Yeah. And the, I mean, the only simple thing is eat real foods. <laughs> That's the, it's and it's a nice simple, simple message, but what it does yeah. is it hides the complexity of nature of this interwoven 
network of how plants and animals work, which is incredibly complex, fascinating, a joy to study. But if there is one simple rule to live by, it is just that, as you say, eat real yeah. food. Well, what other rules do you have? You kind of talk about them at the end of the book. You know, read the ingredient label. Be very suspicious of food that has been engineered to be delicious. So look for the word flavor. If you see natural or if you see artificial, beware. There's been an organic chemist paid a lot of money and focus groups and all sorts of people to make this irresistibly delicious. So that's the one thing I would encourage people to be the most aware of is why does this food taste good? Is it because a human made it taste good? Or is it because nature made it taste good? Mm -hmm. And my advice to people is, you know, because we should augment what we said. It's not just eat real food. Eat the most delicious real food that you can find. Mm. Each meal will be a joy. You'll feel better. You'll feel great. And you'll be healthy. I love it. Because, yeah, if it's a real food and it's delicious for a reason. If it's a fake food, it's delicious. <laughs> it's it's the, a wrong reason. It's, it's not a good reason. reason. Exactly. And I want to tie a few things up. I just remembered when I was, we were talking about what humans crave and foods. And if it's a real food, you should listen to that craving is I've talked to so many people over the years and they're like, oh, I was just craving oysters. I was like, yeah, because you're deficient in B12 and iron and you're eating a plant-based diet. Yes, your body is telling you to eat some oysters because it's super packed with these <laughs> vitamins and minerals you're missing. And there's a history on this, by the way. When you read the... Uh the accounts of these sailors who had suffered from scurvy, you know, for all the people who think that we're just wired for calories, you should listen that one of the first signs of the onset of scurvy was a craving for fruits and vegetables, a craving. These people would sit on, you know, these ships would be floating listlessly, you know, the wind isn't blowing, people are dying of scurvy, and they're sitting there on deck crying at the thought of fruits and vegetables. There's this account of a ship that, I mean, like brutal, like they're throwing bodies overboard by the day. The scurvy is so bad. They finally wind up on this island in the middle of the South Pacific called Juan Fernandez, and they scramble out on shore, and they're eating wild turnips. They found a moss that they started eating. They just grabbed anything mm -hmm. vegetal and stuffed it in their mouth, and they talked about how absolutely delicious it tasted. So this is proof that we have this system. It does work. Now, I guarantee if you and I were to eat that stuff right now, we're both, you know, neither of us has scurvy, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I don't think we'd find that weird moss delicious or those wild turnips delicious, but it's what their body needed at the time. And that mm -hmm. system worked. And guess what? The scurvy went away. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good message of people to listen to their body a little more as long as it's real foods. It's maybe it's like, oh man, salmon sounds so good. Well, maybe you're not getting enough omega-3s, you know, and like, oh, something sounds so good to you and it's a real food, then follow that urge. Yeah, I know. And how can't you? I mean, I uh, I eat a lot of steak. I find often, I don't want to say heavy on carbs, but just a light meal that has carbs in it. I love fresh, mm -hmm. I love to make my own pasta, for example. Mm -hmm. But I find I kind of need a steak afterwards. Um, yeah. And boy, does that steak taste good. Now, that makes me sound like someone who eats a lot. I'm just a bit over six feet tall and I weigh about 172 pounds. So I'm not a big, big person. I love to eat. I guess I don't eat that much food. Otherwise, I'd weigh a lot more. But I feel that need for that steak. I mean, that that fresh pasta with olive oil and Parmesan cheese was delicious, but I need a steak. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get it. Uh, yeah, I love that. And I also wanted to wrap up about, you know, you're talking about the flavor model of obesity or this hijacked flavor model. I think there's something really to that. And I think there's, my thing is the satiety model of obesity. So we're, we're kind of talking, a lot of these things are talking about satiety and why- I think they're interwoven. Um, yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. They're very related. So the problem is you're eating all these processed foods, hyper palatable foods, nutrient devoid foods. They're not satiating. Right. No, so that they're yeah. exactly in the moment you stick it in your mouth, it tastes good. You swallow, but you're hungry again because you didn't get what you needed. But when you eat real food, you're not in this constant state of hunger. It's like that beef jerky example I mentioned. You put it down the hatch and you're done. You know, you move on to other things. You're not sitting there obsessed with food all day. Well, I know a woman, Laura Spath, she's going to be in the film. She lost half her body from 280 to 140 
by just being full by eating meat and by and she went from constantly craving being food addicted really right to completely okay with food because of just satiety and, and satiety. Foods, yeah. yeah. Well, and you know something, I'll bring it back to that example I mentioned earlier. Remember I was talking about how delicious a peach is. Here's the interesting thing. You know, some people say, well, don't eat fruit. It's got sugar in it. But here's the thing. Could you eat an entire basket of peaches? I mean, I adore peaches, but I think after two peaches, I'm done. Yep. I mean, it's a wonderful experience, but I'm not going to sit there gorging on peaches and then getting into a melting into a puddle of depression because I ate <laughs> 48 peaches and what have I done to myself? They're delicious. You eat it, you love it, and mm. you're done. You're satisfied. That's how it's supposed to work. That's how food works. This actually ties into everything. We're talking about the level of processing. It's because you have that matrix of fiber and all the stuff that's intact that your body has a different reaction to it and you have a different satiety level. And if you try to drink the peach juice, you could consume 10 peaches because you took out all the fiber and you just got 10 peaches worth of juice. And then that would be way too much sugar and that interacts with your body in a completely different way, different satiety mechanisms and obviously different sugar amount, blood sugar, roller coaster, all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. But there again, you get into processing. And if it wasn't for that, there wouldn't be a problem. You'd just eat one or two peaches and drink some water and everything would be great. <laughs> well, Let's wrap this up here. So do you have sort of a good outlook on the future? I think you, you mentioned that in your book. Yeah, it's funny. This all sounds terribly depressing. But I think the first thing is, if you want to find out the right direction, you need to know what the wrong direction is. And I think it's important, as alarming as all this stuff is, and, and we seem like we're doomed to eat food that was designed to destroy us. Well, at least now that we know that and we know what to look out for, that's a good first step. But I would also say there's a lot of really positive signs. As bad as things might be in America with the obesity rate and so forth, look at things like the craft beer movement. If you got into a time machine and went back to 1988 and got a whole bunch of beer executives and said, you know, guys, in 2020, craft beer, these beers that are made by, you know, these hipsters with big beards and stuff that are intensely <laughs> yeah. tannic and they put coffee in them and they put this – they would laugh you out of the room because all anyone drank back then was like Genesee and Michelob and Bud. Look at how our palate for beer has changed. And it has changed. It's been driven by a desire for more flavor, for more authenticity. Uh, look at how the wine palate has changed. I think it's good that we seek wine as a beverage to have with a meal. I mean, obviously, don't drink way too much of it and become an alcoholic. But we seek complexity in that beverage. I think it's way better to have a glass of wine with your dinner than it is to have a soft drink. If you look at cheese, you know, it used to be that American cheese was, was literally processed cheese. Uh, there's this wonderful flourishing artisanal cheese movement where people are making real cheese from real cows that eat grass. And that's a wonderful thing. So this, I mean, we got a long way to go. Don't get me wrong, but there are signs of positive change. And I think if, if we celebrate that, I think things will improve. I agree. And the technology side, I think that we went too far with the technology about food, but I think technology can play a big role by it's assisting, gonna. by assisting in a, it, it's going to facilitate ancient methods. I actually did some bigger presentation about no, this. No, you're, you're totally right. And, and we've been using technology all along. You know, I talked a lot in the book about a scientist at the University of Florida named Harry Klee, who has been studying flavor in tomatoes. A lot of us love heirloom tomatoes because they taste so good, but an heirloom tomato is just basically cutting edge tomato technology in like 1902. Mm -hmm. Well, Harry Klee has identified the flavors in tomatoes that make them taste good, and he has made tomatoes that have all the benefits of modern commercial tomatoes, like a, a good shelf life. They don't bruise really easily, but they have this incredible tomato flavor. This is wonderful. This is really good news. It means that one day we can walk into the supermarket and buy a basket of tomatoes that tastes delicious, that tastes the way tomatoes are supposed to taste. So technology got us into this mess, but the way to get out of it is not to live like it's 1941. We can also use technology to get out of this mess, and I think we're going to have to. Yeah, that's what my presentation is about. It's about using technology to facilitate ancient methods and how regenerative farming can solve, I think they made up this for me, at this conference can solve four world problems. 
And I really think that if we can go back these smaller mixed farms instead of monocropping and use plants and animals together and then facilitate that with technology, whether it be some kind of genetically modified plants or if it's just actual technology where we could have drone type, you know, rotational grazing that have, you know, drones, movable solar powered drone little things that can move the cows. Yeah. Yeah. Like instead of the wolves moving the bison, it's like a drone moving the cow. Exactly. It's mimicking nature's ways. And there's a lot we still need to learn, but we're learning and things are getting better. I mean, you mentioned that you have a grass fed beef company. I think that's great. I am a huge passionate lover of good grass fed beef. It tastes delicious because it's good for you. And the more we learn about how ruminants, cattle, bison, how they existed, how they rotationally grazed by their predators, when we can mimic that using modern technology, we all stand to benefit. Yep. Yep. Just facilitate. So modern tech can facilitate ancient methods. I believe we have enough land to do this. If we get rid of millions of acres of the the bad things, corn, wheat, and soy, or we don't need all this stuff, if we just do it the natural way. Maybe we should touch on the book steak a little more for the ending of this because you just mentioned grass-fed beef. And what's kind of the, the wrap of the book steak and you traveled to different places around the world? Yeah, the wrap up was the whole world is eating really mediocre beef. And basically it's because almost everybody's eating grain-fed beef to one degree or another. Americans eat really heavily grain-fed beef, but almost everyone's using some grain. It used to be you could go to places like Argentina and get authentic grass-fed beef. I've only heard stories. Well, you know, I had great Argentine beef in the mid 90s. I visited my brother. He was down there. I just graduated university. We went fly fishing in Patagonia. And then he bought a Argentine tenderloin that we grilled. And it was that's where it started. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's the question was, why was that steak so good? Uh And that is where my food journey started. That's literally why I'm talking to you today was because of that steak. It blew me away. But we use grain because you can get cattle fat quick. Uh, It's kind of like using oak and wine, though. Grain-fed beef isn't, like, disgusting, uh, Mm -hmm. but it also isn't particularly beefy. It's just sort of characterless. It's like over-oaking a wine. You just created something sort of generic and uninteresting. Grass-fed beef, on the other hand, I would compare to something like a burgundy. Not easy to do. I've had a lot of really bad grass-fed beef. You have to be an artist and a scientist and a grass farmer to create great grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. But when it's done, when all that comes together... And these cattle get fat on grass the way they were meant to. It is one of the best foods there is, period. That Argentine steak changed my life, and I'm still chasing it. I love great grass-fed beef. It is one of the best things there is that you can put in your mouth. It's just incredible. I have to agree. And, I mean, probably the best meal of my life, I don't know how it's going to get better, was at Tara's farm. She's at Slowdown Farmstead on Instagram. She's amazing, but she, you know, I told you, she raises all of her animals by hand. She's been learning it. She's a retired nutritionist. You know, maybe this would be the last stop in your journey. She doesn't invite people to her farm, but a meal, everything she served us. I was there for two days filming with her. It was the best thing I've ever had. Satisfied me in a way that you can't explain. I felt like I was, could never eat again, where I was just like, I'm satisfied and full in a way that I, I've never and not loaded full, not like I no. can't move, I, you know, no. somebody call an ambulance full, but full like I'm satiated. Uh, but that it, like if you and I had to get up and like move a, like a table or something, we could. Yes. Um, you, you're not like in need of a CPR or whatever. Oh, exactly. Because if you went to a buffet and ate a bunch of trash, that's what you'd feel like. But I ate the same amount of calories, but I felt fantastic. And we went around and went on a hike, you know, through the woods. And yeah, yeah it sounds great. Well, I would say next step is you got to come back and we should do some eating. We have fun. Well, yeah, Toronto. I'll be there in July. Um, maybe we could make some plans. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this. I can't wait for your new book that is somewhat secretive. But, you know, maybe you could come back on next year when it launches. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. We'll have lots more to talk about. And it, it really builds on a lot of what we're talking about. And it, and it really gets into the why. And that would be a lot of fun. I'd look forward to that. Great. Well, I'm writing a book too, and it's all about this satiety and all this kind of stuff. So maybe there'll be some overlap there, but, uh, it's like, we're both writing the same book. It turns out, (laughs) oh my God, (laughs) that's so funny. Cause I had Dr. Ted Naiman on, who's a big nutrition guy and doctor, and we thought we were writing the same book, but we joked around about it a lot, but they're all different and we're all trying to spread the good word. 
So well, it's been a real pleasure, and it's been so nice speaking. Great questions, and it's these are just subjects that are dear to my heart. And you've managed to make me very hungry. <laughs> so it's <laughs> all right. Time. Well, yeah, I'm about to eat a steak myself. Uh, it's about 1 p.m. here in LA, and uh, awesome talk. And I'll catch up with you at some point. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Brian. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Come back next week. Go to sapien.org to find out all the good info about Food Lies, which is still on Indiegogo, about the health tech we're building, about nosetail.org, where you can get the grass-finished meat delivered to your door, raised in America, and all the other good stuff. Share this podcast with friends and family. Give it a review on iTunes. We're going strong. I think we'll hit 500 reviews soon, which would be awesome. Thank you so much and stay happy and healthy.